we are pleased to have Francis Brown with us today at the Peabody Public Library for the Whitley County Oral History Project. This is May the 5th, 2010, and I am John Pius. And appreciate your being with us today, Francis. Well, it's quite an honor to talk about Whitley County because I have learned to call it home after all these years. Okay, where were you born and raised? I was born in uh, Clearwater, Florida. I lived there until I was eight years old, and then my mother became a widow, and her brothers and sisters, uh, she had 11, uh, thought we should be more close to the family. So we moved back to Pineapple, Alabama, where all my relatives were, and uh, that was the greatest thing in the world, to grow up in a town like Pineapple. And how did you happen to get to Whitley County? I went to school at Moore Academy in, in Pineapple, which was the greatest school ever. And then I went to Judson College and met my husband, who was a test pilot during the Second World War at uh, Montgomery at the airfield there. We were married, and after the war, when he returned from Europe, he had been going to college before the war for two years at Indiana Tech in Fort Wayne, Indiana, even though he was from New York. He had heard that Indiana Tech helped students get a job and get their education, which helped financially a great deal. And after the war, all the GIs came home with the GI Bill, and this made it very difficult to choose a college. But the law was, that if you had attended a college before, they had to take you back first before they took anyone else. So in Indiana Tech, Fort Wayne, Indiana was it. And we moved here in 1946. And where exactly did you live here? Well, that is the interesting part because for four years during the Second World War, nothing was built in the way of houses or apartments or anything. And so here are all these GIs returning with brides and no place to live. We were able to live in a one room boarding, not a boarding house, but just a room sleeping place on uh, West Washington Street in Fort Wayne. Uh, the landlady let us have a 40 watt bulb. We were both students and we studied by flashlight in that one room. The situation was so horrible for all of these young men coming back that the mayor of Fort Wayne decided to open the prisoner of war camp, which was located out on Wayne Trace. It was called Camp Scott. They had just removed, moved out the uh, German prisoners of war. This was a big secret because people living in Fort Wayne were not even aware that the German prisoners of war were housed right there in their midst. I guess it was because of fear and that sort of thing. So they moved them out and then there were barracks, just plain tar paper barracks, not insulated, uh, no plumbing on the inside of the barracks. There was a latrine where you walked about a block away. So we were able to rent one large room uh, from the government. <laughs> it was like paradise because we could use a 75 watt bulb and a little bit light on the subject. We were there from uh, August until February. And every day we haunted the Fort Wayne newspapers and trying to find something for sale that we could afford. Finally, we saw an ad in the paper for Tri Lakes. Neither of us had ever heard of Tri Lakes, but we were able to find it, and that was the days before you could get MapQuest or that you had the GPS situation. You had to ask people, and people kept saying, oh, it's over by Busco. Well, Busco wasn't on the map. 
We didn't know that its name was Cherubusco. Well, this was a big search and a big adventure. We found the little tiny cottage at Tri Lakes and we bought it and moved in. And okay. we intended, he drove back and forth to school in Fort Wayne and I already began working at Lincoln Life Insurance Company. It's where all the women seemed to work at those days. Um, and it was a great place to work. We drove back and forth to Fort Wayne each day, but gas was much cheaper then, so it wasn't a big hardship. It was just time consuming. And uh, when Ed graduated, we he had many job offers because he was a good student. And But Essex Wire offered him a job, and he took it, and here I am, many years later, 64 years later, still living in Whitley County. Okay. And couldn't have been a better place. Yeah. Now, you lived by the uh, Baptist Church in Tri Lakes, did you? Of course, time? it wasn't there then. Oh, okay. We donated the land for them to build an interdenominational church, uh, which happened to be the property next to where I lived. 1952, they began digging a basement there. Uh, not with machinery. People pitched in with shovels, and of course it was wonderful Indiana clay. There were ladies out there who were expecting babies, and there they were with shovels, a group of dedicated people. The shovels were left propped up against a tree, so anytime anyone had 15 minutes to shovel dirt, People would just stop in at any time and throw a shovel of clay out. Finally, the basement was done and they began having churches there. The church later became the Tri Lakes Baptist Church, which was the General Assembly of Baptists. Okay. You are very familiar with the church on State Road 9, too. Yes, because we had become members there. Um, before, and so we did, never did transfer our membership. We were supportive to the Tri Lakes Church uh, for their needs, and we went to special meetings there. But the St. John's United Brethren Church, in 19, which it was in 1947, the United Brethren Church joined with the Evangelical Churches and became the EUB, or the Evangelical United Brethren Church, in 1948. So then we were EUBs, and it was St. John's EUB Church, all the way up to 1968, when the EUBs joined with the Methodists, which was a, a monumental merger. And the EUBs did not have uh, women delegates. We sort of took a back seat. But somehow I got elected as an alternate delegate to go to Dallas, Texas for the merger of the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren, never dreaming that I would ever have to go. Three days before the convention in Dallas, I had a phone call that the delegate had had a heart attack and that since I was the alternate, I would be able to go. I had a very understanding uh, principal at Thorn Creek School where I taught. His name was Kenneth Helmer, who was a good, staunch Methodist man, and he allowed me to take uh, Thursday and Friday, and of course I was off Saturday and Sunday. So four days in Dallas for the big merger. And then after 1968, all the Methodist churches were called the United Methodist Church. Of course, the United was from the old EUB, so they kept part of that name. Okay. I believe you were a uh, member of the Tri Lakes Garden Club. Um, yes. Well, they go way back to... Yes, United. back to the early 50s. Okay. I think I was the token young person because <laughs> all the ladies that belonged were very elegant and very classy ladies. Well, for example... Uh, Dr. Herriter's mother was a member. 
Okay. Um, uh, Mrs. Bushy from Muncie, who lived over in Muncie Colony at Tri Lakes, was one of the members. And uh, there were several others. I know there was a uh, Lily Bell Michael Felder, because her name was so rhythmic that my little daughter, who was about four years old, played dress up ladies, and her name was always Miss Lily Bell Michael Felder. <laughs> and uh, so I do remember her name. And there was a Dorothy Lika. And uh, in those days for Garden Club, we wore hats and gloves, and we were dressed to the nines. It was a very elegant affair. Where would you meet? We met in homes. Okay. And did they have a flower sh show? Yes, we became a member of the state garden clubs, and each year we had a flower show, which was a big turnout. And I remember there was a, a Vera Pontius, and John, I think she was your mother. Yes. That. Uh, we vied and uh, were great competitors when it came to arranging. Okay. And I think we came out usually with an equal number of ribbons, okay. which was a nice thing because both of us worked very, very hard at those shows. We studied books. We got pictures from magazines. Uh, we even sent to the state and they sent us pictures of arrangements, real artistic things not just flowers and a bouquet, and it was a great experience. Okay, so how long uh, were you a uh, teacher at Thorn Creek? Uh, and what cl and I what substituted class? from 1950, and in other words, eight, almost 18 years. The pay was very little, but I was a teacher at heart, and the nice thing about substituting you could go if you wanted or could if you were able to, but you could say no if you had a sick child at home. So until my children got up through the mumps, measles, and chicken box, then I began teaching at Thorn Creek for pay in 1967. And I taught until 1992. Uh, back then, uh, who hired teachers? Well, I think it was pretty much uh, the trustee was led by the principal. And as I said before, okay. Mr. Helmer was the principal. And uh, I had been acquainted with him through substituting all these years. And I guess he put up with me for 18 years subbing. And uh, so when he realized I was ready to take a job, he uh, said, now you will be teaching at our school. Well, Mr. Dale Pence was the assistant superintendent in Columbia City, and I had offers from him. Also, I had been subbing down at Washington Center, and the principal there, Mr. Uh, Welker, asked me to teach there. So I felt very, very wonderful to have three principals offering me jobs. Of course, in those days, it wasn't like it is now. And of course, the trustee went along with whatever the principal said. Who hires teachers nowadays? I think it's through, I'm not really sure, but I'm pretty sure that it's through the um, superintendent's office, the okay. counties, of uh, the superintendent of Whitley County Schools. Okay. Um, I know they have to go through interviews and they have to have lots of references and resumes, and I didn't have to have any of that. Back when you first started, uh, what would uh, average uh, teacher salary be, you suppose? In 1967, my salary was $6,532 a year. I thought it was a fortune in those days. And now it's uh, much more than that. Much more. Uh, it's under 30, I think, for a beginning teacher. Okay. I remember it was 25000 a few years ago. Okay. Um, has teaching uh, changed uh, much since you first started, uh, like uh, the lesson plans or whatever? Not so much the lesson plans, but with the administration and the amount of paperwork a teacher has to do nowadays. Okay. Everyone told me when I retired in 19, 
92 that the next year everything went to pieces because they didn't have time to teach and they would complain about if they would just let us teach. But we're doing so much paperwork and we have to keep all these records. It was a whole different turnaround. And so I'm thankful that I had the time when I could put my heart and soul into what I thought the child needed and I was not dictated to by what the government thought the child needed. Okay. Did uh, children uh, change much from when you got started? Uh, Very much so. When I began teaching, of course, there weren't nearly as many working mothers. And many of the children at Thorn Creek still lived on farms, and they were expected to uh, help with the farm chores and that sort of thing. And as the years went by in our economy, our whole culture changed with both parents working, and it just, there became a whole different atmosphere and a different emphasis. I had wonderful parents who were behind me as a teacher. Parents who came in and would sit across from my desk and say, what am I going to do with my child? And I would say, because I was in junior high, somehow when a child is 13, there's an alien that comes, steals your child away, and it leaves this body that looks like your child, but it really isn't. But just hang in there, hang tight, and usually about 15 or 17 or maybe even 21, the alien returns your child again. And you'll be so thankful you didn't lose your mind while this was all happening. So parents were very, very concerned about their children, I found in those days. And they worked with the teacher. I felt like we were a team, um, that we were all in this together for the good of the child. It wasn't teacher, parent, but we worked as teams. Did that change? Uh... From what, I'm not an authority on what's changed, but from the things I hear from other teachers, it not, has not been the same for several, many years. Uh, since 1992, anyway, there are many more parents who, um, have it against the teacher and I know it's because of frustration because of things that are happening in their own lives they're stressed out from their jobs and so often the teacher's the one who gets blamed if a child doesn't do what he's supposed to do and I suppose that has become pretty much the norm now I'm not speaking about all teachers just too many cases for it to be comfortable anymore. When did spanking stop? Well, I never had to touch a child. We just seemed to work together. and I, I would have been appalled if I had ever even felt like spanking a child. Uh, the principal now, that was a different story because I think that uh, the public demanded that the principal be an authoritarian figure and have, be the disciplinarian. And I do remember some of the students getting so many paddles um, down okay. at the principal's office. Did um, children's uh, clothes uh, change much over those very years? Very much so. They were very conservative <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. And up until about uh, 80, 1986. And then with uh, so many things on television showing so many different designs and clothes and so many programs on television, the sitcoms with teenagers on, that naturally uh, the little farm boys and girls tried to emulate the, uh, uh, the their peers on television. And so the clothes became sometimes a little outrageous and uh, much less fabric, especially for the girls. And uh, Did they wear uh, dresses anymore? Yeah. And they did in the 60s and the 70s, but uh, pretty much 
And they were allowed to wear shorts, but they could not be short shorts toward the end. They had to have uh, a seam, <laughs> had a few inches below uh, the middle of the garment. But, of course, you know, it was natural to try to see what you could get away with. But we had some great big sweatshirts that would cover a barn down at Mr. Helmer's office of the other principal, Mr. Parks. And uh, often we would uh, sort of kid the kids that, you know, if you come with something a little skinny and you we think you're cold, we're going to ask you to go down and get yourself one of those sweatshirts to put on. And so it became kind of a fun thing, too. And uh, pretty much they respected it in those days. Was there a change of interest in subjects? Like there was a time when the kids really wanted to learn one particular subject and, and then later on they kind of wanted to, there were other things they were more interested in? Yes, I think it was only natural that teenagers uh, changed with the, what was currently popular. Uh, there weren't too many boys and girls in the 70s and 80s and early 90s who said, oh, I'm going to be a farmer. But there were two, I remember, two boys, and they today are very, very successful farmers. But that's all they ever wanted to be. And uh, But many of my former students have become doctors and attorneys, and many of them have become teachers. So I would say, yes, subject matter changed with the trend of what's was a popular career. Did, uh, do, do, when they, when uh, kids grow up, do they uh, ever come back to look up teachers and, you know, maybe thank them? I am so fortunate. I've often said, I didn't make much money when I began, while I was teaching. I, that is, I had enough, and I was very proud of that. But there were many of the, uh, my colleagues who went on to become CEOs of companies and their salaries were enormous. But I felt, I still feel this way, that I am repaid in dividends almost every week or month of my life since because students come back and they'll call on the phone, hey, I'm in town to visit my grandmother. Could we do lunch or breakfast? And I've had so many that are still in contact. Of course, I get invited to the baby showers, and now I'm getting invited to the their grandchildren's baby showers. Okay. So it's been a very wonderful uh, uh, to have rapport with people that you can carry on, like you just left the classroom. Uh, what kind of building was it? Was it uh, an adequate place for uh, We thought school? it was the most wonderful building. It was an old brick building. I think it was built back in the 1930s. It certainly was sufficient. And uh, in the late 80s, they began to talk about uh, upgrading buildings that some of the buildings were not adequate. And I remember one inspector from the state was standing in the hall at Thorn Creek and he, I said, what are you finding wrong with our building? And he said, well, just look, your halls are too narrow. <laughs> and I said, we haven't run into each other and killed each other yet. I mean, you just walk around people in a hall. But uh, that just didn't cut it because they were to have so many feet across the hall for student. And so, Thorn Creek was demolished shortly after that and a new school built. And that was uh, Northern Heights. Northern Heights replaced it, replaced okay. Thorn Creek Center. Now you, there was a time when you had uh, polio vaccinations. Uh, oh, back in the 50s, polio was still a scare. And many people remembered from the 40s, many, many children contacted polio in fact, the whole summer long in Alabama, we weren't allowed to go to any social events, like to a movie theater 
or anywhere because it was a fear of catching polio and becoming crippled for life, if not losing your life or being spending your life in an iron lung. It was a big, big, scary thing. And then in the 1950s, they, scientists developed the sugar cube. They put the polio vaccine on a sugar cube and around the state, naturally Thorn Creek was a center uh, in our area. And so I remember that we set up, uh, the lines were long and there was a doctor there with a sugar cube and would squirt the medicine on the sugar cube and somebody would pop it into the person's mouth. I remember the medicine was yellow. <laughs> it looked like it would give you something, not keep you from, <laughs> from having something. But their lines were long and people came in and got their sugar cube. Uh, and then after, several years after that, uh, Jonas Salk developed the vaccine, vaccination against um, polio and I guess been very few polio cases in our country since. Progress, I think we call it, medical progress. Were there times when um, a lot of kids uh, got sick uh, all at once, uh, that sort of thing? Do you mean, uh, was, was there the a flu lot of sickness or, in our school? Yeah. Occasional colds, but I don't remember very many um, times when students were out more than a day or two. Was there a school nurse uh, ever? No, we had no school nurse. Okay. Um, back in 78 there was a blizzard. How did that affect school? The blizzard, the big blizzard of 78. We went home from school, the school was dismissed because the snow was coming down like nothing I've ever seen before. We managed to get home on a Wednesday. We thought we were just going to be snowed in and read books and have a, a wonderful vacation at home, but that was not the case. The next day on Thursday, I had a call from the Sheriff's Department. Now the Sheriff has never called me before, and I couldn't imagine what I could have done wrong because I hadn't been out, could not have gotten out of my house to do anything. He said, uh, Mrs. Stuckey, do you have a, a cold or flu? And I said, no, but why would the police want to know that? And the sheriff says, we're just checking to see if you are well enough to go out to the nursing home because the workers at the nurse, that work at the nursing home, which was called the Alfred Nursing Home, uh, it they can't get to work. They live in Cherubusco and Pearson and there's no one working out. The staff is just way down, and all of these people in the nursing home need help. He said, I'm going to send a snowmobile to 309 Shinneman, and the driver will take you out to the nursing home. Wear two layers of clothes and stuff an extra pair of underwear in the pockets of your jacket because I'm not sure if you'll get home Thursday night or not. Well, pretty soon I heard the roar of a snowmobile. I had never been on one in my life. The man who was driving it, I will never know who he was. He was completely covered with a mask, a uh, face mask and everything. I got on the back and held on for dear life. And I didn't recognize where we were going at all because the snow had gotten over the fence post you couldn't find the road. Finally, I thought we had been on that snowmobile long, longer than I thought it was to get us to Alfram. And so I squeezed real hard and hit him in the back and he slowed down and I said, I think we're lost. So we were almost to Laurel instead of the Alfram nursing home, which is halfway between here and Laurel. We turned around and went over across some more fields and he put me out finally at the Alfred nursing home. I didn't get home until the next Sunday night. I was not a nurse, but I could cook. There had been no, there were no bread deliveries, no trucks coming in with milk or bread 
or any other supplies, but the home had a big, big pantry. But you had to just make do. You could not go by the regular menus because they would, you would be short two or three ingredients of what you had to have. So I cooked up some pretty good southern meals because I knew how to make biscuits. And there were just big bags of flour there. But the nursing home people didn't understand why they didn't have the food that they ordinarily had. The first meal, I remember cooking macaroni and cheese because the government at that time supplied um, institutions with a, a great deal of cheese. And so we had macaroni and cheese, which they had, don't think they had ever had homemade macaroni and cheese that you put eggs in. And it wasn't uh, mac and cheese out of a craft box, believe me. Uh, they were a little disgruntled, the patients, because they didn't understand what was going on and why I was in this kitchen cooking. And, uh, but after the second day, they were, hunger got to, the, to them and they ate everything I cooked. And it was a most interesting time. We all survived, no one starved, and, uh, but Winter County was pretty much shut down during that blizzard of 1978. Okay. I understand you were a judge for high school speech and debate competitions for yes, many years. Yes, that has been one of the greatest things. Um, I've always been interested in speech and debate, and so when I retired from teaching regularly, and I went to India the next year to teach, and came back and I said to the speech coach, Mr. Bob Britton, at the high school, if you need any help with judging on Saturdays, I'm available. So I've been doing that since 1992 and this is 2010. And usually on Saturday morning, Still doing about 5.30 or quarter of six, Mr. Britton would pick me up from October through March. Saturdays were spent going with the high school speech and debate teams to different schools throughout northern Indiana, Plymouth, Elkhart, the schools in Fort Wayne, LaGrange, just some of the ones where we went on Saturdays. I met many wonderful people, many wonderful students, and have a great many more friends than I would have if I had been sitting on the couch back at my home. Could you tell about uh, the history uh, of success uh, uh, with uh, Columbia City High School speech and debate? Back in the 50s and 60s, there was a, a very wonderful teacher called Miss um, Miss Thornburg, Bertha, I think her name yes. was Bertha Thornburg, and she had a reputation of uh, being able to whip together students that came out with winners all the time. Now she was a hard act to follow. And so from that time, uh, it would depend upon who was doing the speech. Mr. Britton was head of the whole thing, but of course he couldn't do it. There were usually two other coaches who assisted him. Some of them loved their jobs and were able to get students to do well. And so it wasn't the first priority, let's put it that way. So the speech team and the debate team have sort of been up and down. Now Mr. Britton was uh, lost his life recently, two or three weeks ago, and um, he had the ability to inspire students to know they were winners before they ever went to the meet. And it carried over. And the day of his death, they won the state debate trophy, the huge trophy that travels uh, from one school to another. And they brought that home on Saturday night, and that was on top of Mr. Britton's casket for his funeral three days later. Was this the first time Columbia City ever won a state championship? I can't answer that because um, in the glass cases at the high school, there are many, many, many trophies. 
and I, I don't believe it was the first time because we have had wonderful debate teams uh, for a long time. But this was the first time, I think, that they won the state in the last, I would say, 10 or 12 years. Okay. Well, speaking of Robert Britton, uh, was he, he was on the library board. He was he president, I believe, of the library board recently. Um, is your question, was he involved in the community? No, no at the library board. Yes, he was most involved in this community. He was elected to the library board. He retired two years ago from teaching. He was elected to the library board and served so faithfully. He was also a member of our literacy council. In fact, last Monday night he would have been our next president. So it was very sad that we had to elect a, another president that in, with that quick of a notice. He was also, for many years, uh, he used the Key Club, which was a member of Kiwanis. Mr. Britton was most involved with Kiwanis and its many community activities. But the Key Club, that means the high school students um, who are interested in service and it's sponsored by the Kiwanis Clubs. Mr. Britton has, would have the Key Club go and set up for the Blood Mobile every time the Blood Mobile visited Columbia City. And uh, he was just seen unloading tables and chest and all of this every time. And not only to unload it early in the morning, but to come back after six o'clock closing time and put it back on the Red Cross truck. So he was involved in many, many things, uh, some I don't even know about, but he was just a man who served the community and uh, served it well. Now, you were on the library board uh, for how long? 38 years uh, from my job. And I enjoyed every time I came to a meeting when we built the new library I will admit a little frustration because our meetings used to, we used to meet at 7 and we were usually out of the library board meeting by 8. But then became all the plans for the new building and many nights we uh, went home after 11 o'clock. But it certainly was worth all the planning because the Peabody Public Library is just, I think, the most wonderful library in the world. and my. People that come to visit me from other states, we don't have a great deal to show them in Columbia City that would be of interest, but I always drag them to the library and they are just amazed at all of the activities, the beautiful building, and all of the services that the Peabody Public Library is able to do. Uh, about the, the cost of the library, was that a problem? Of a new library? Well, cost of anything, I guess, in a small town is a problem. Mm -hmm. And I remember with fear and trembling signing, signing the uh, mortgage, the loan papers, and I never had borrowed any money. And here I was signing a paper for over four million dollars. But I thought, oh well, it'll all will be well. I'm just sure that. Columbia City is going to get behind this project. They did, and with grants we were able to. I don't remember it being a big hassle. It just sort of fell together in spite of what everyone thought. Now, did they have to close the library a while when they brought all the books over? Uh... Yes, when the, this building, the new building was ready. Uh, the books came over. It, very orderly. Um, of course, you know, they weren't just all, they tried to keep them with a duodecimal system, the 800s together and the 200s. So uh, that was well done. It was well organized. The library staff planned all of that and it went very smoothly. Uh, at the time you were first on the library board, uh, who were some of the people, other people on the board? Uh, there was a, a very well-known attorney in this town, uh, 
John White Leather Sr. Uh, my goodness, I didn't know you were going to ask me this. Um, Eugene Byers was on the board. Do you remember, John, any of the... What, were there some me a little. little Floxes or... Uh, oh, Richard Flox. Okay. Um, Richard. From the Flox department store. We okay. really did have a department store in Columbia Six. Said it was called Floxes. It was on the corner of uh, Chauncey and Van Buren. No longer there. What? It's no longer there. Uh, no, there are other things in that building now. The building is still there. But for many, many years, we did our shopping at Flox's department store, long before Walmart. It was even a mm -hmm. twinkle in anyone's eye. And Richard Flox was one of the owners. And his he was a very uh, learned man. Literature was his thing. And he was a member of the library board. Was, uh, and we didn't Adams. have to have the internet. Anything I needed to know, I just picked up the phone and said, Richard, could you please tell me this quote that goes da 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 da? Oh yes, that's Hamlet Act Three, da da da. And uh, I don't ever remember asking him a question on a quote or the name of a book or an author that he didn't immediately answer correctly. Uh, do you remember a uh, library director uh, back when you first started? Uh, Phyllis Man, yes, there were several, but they didn't stay, you know, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, Phyllis Manego was our faithful library director all those years. She suffered with um, MS and found it very difficult to get in and out of the library because, of course, it was not handicapped accessible, but she would drag that precious body up and down the steps with the help of a staff or her husband until she just couldn't do it anymore. And that was in the early 90s. And we were fortunate to hire Janet Skank, the present director, and she's been with us that many years, which was a real blessing because Janet um, was trained in library science, whereas Phyllis didn't have all the degrees but she knew how to do things. But Janet knew the state laws, and we were getting ready to build this, had to go through the process of building the new building. And the members of the library board, we had no idea of the laws and what the laws required in a new building. But Janet was a big, big help during that time. Who was the president of the library board at the time the uh, new building was built? Uh, Jim Fleck, who is the mayor of Columbia City now, uh, was president of the library board when we were building. Uh, I believe he wrote a book. I'm sorry. Uh, he wrote a book about libraries. Uh, I uh, yes, and, uh, and um, it wasn't fiction, of course, it was non-fiction. Okay. And he was writing a, a book about uh, programming and things of that sort of thing in a library. Okay, and I believe he was president of the Indiana Library Trustees Association. He had a high office, I'm not remembering. Yes. I do not remember exactly uh, what it was. But I did go with him to attend a meeting in Indianapolis. Uh, where he received a plaque at one time. Um, you mentioned uh, Phloxes, uh, and you, were there other stores or uh, businesses that you really oh, miss? Yes, I still have a wonderful blouse uh, shirt, blouse, that uh, I bought at the Style Shop, which was run by Sade Rush, the mother of um, Let's see, she was related to Mike, Michael Rush, one of the judges here in Columbia City. And uh, she ran a classy little store called the Style Shop. Uh, you didn't look like you walked out of Kmart or Walmart when you came out of the Style Shop wearing 
something that you had bought there. Now we have nothing like that in the way of being able to go buy something stylish in Columbia City. Okay. Um, do you remember restaurants that you used to go to that are no longer here? I remember, uh, was it Penguin Point? And uh, the teenagers were all brownie Penguin Point, and that when you got in the car, and you just drove round and round to see who else was driving round and round. And it was called Brownie Penguin Point. And of course, where, where was this? That was up by the uh, railroad tracks close to Swinehart. I think there's a restaurant called Big G's Sports Bar okay. in that location at, at the present time. But the big, wonderful, elegant restaurant that we need, so need now, was called the 30 Club. And it, people went there on special occasions. It, want, it wasn't the kind of restaurant you went dropped in after work with your baseball cap on. When you went to the 30 Club, you were dressed in your very best, and you had your best manners. And there were linen tablecloths and silver and goblets, and it was just an elegant place to go. And if you had drop-in company and you weren't prepared to cook a meal, you could always take them to the 30 Club, and they would have a wonderful, enjoyable experience. We need another 30 Club. What happened to the 30 Club? It closed down and moved across town with another buyer, but it was, and I know that the other 30 Club was somewhere north of town, and I, I could picture it, but I can't think exactly the spot, but uh, it didn't last, it just didn't have the ambiance that the original 30 Club had and it stayed in business a very short time. I know it was in business in 1985, uh, and after that I don't think it lasted. Um, what other changes uh, since you first came to this area do you regret? You know, worth, uh, you changes that I regret? In, in the community. Uh, I can't think of anything but good changes. Okay. Um, people seem to work together very well in Columbia City. If there's a cause, in my opinion, people have get behind it and make it work when it comes to building something. Uh, the Y, for instance, there was a drive and people would just dig deep uh, in order to, to for us to have a, a YMCA here in town, as well as our library and any other project. The hospital when the hospital went in in the late 1950s. Uh, people saw to it that we needed a hospital and we got one. And of course the big changes is our population and other industries moving into town and the population, the center of population, gradually moving north of Columbia City instead of south or west or east. The uh, the uh, housing areas, most of them have most of them have been to the north, and uh, the is center that, of population is probably, they say, about where the library is at the present time. I suppose uh, when they uh, uh, thirty came north of Columbia City, that created a lot of uh, more growth up that way. And yes, made a big I think change. thirty. Highway 30 had a great deal to do with it. Uh, when would that have been, roughly? In the 60s? You know, I'm not sure, because okay. I really had more on my mind than highways. Okay. They were more of an inconvenience when everything was closed down. But I, it, you're probably right, it's late 60s, I would think. Okay. Well, uh, is there anything else you would like to add to all of this? Uh, well, I would like to say that when I moved to Indiana from Pineapple, Alabama, I had never experienced snow nor ice storms. And I thought this was kind of the land that God forgot. But each year that I lived here, I became to love it more. 
But it was several years before I could really say it's home. But thank goodness it's home because it's a very wonderful, wonderful community. Well, Francis, uh, thank you so much for coming to tell your story and your life and uh, for the benefit of future generations. And thank you.